Welcome to Series 7 of The Dig Podcast, and I am your host, Caroline O'Neill. In this series, I am talking to business owners, entrepreneurs, and experts who are sharing their journey and preparing us for the future. What does the working world look like in the future? It changes every week, every day, every hour. So tune in each week as I ask my guests how they are future-proofing their business. Today on the Dig Podcast, I am speaking to Niall McKenna and it's very appropriate to have him as a guest because we're actually recording the Dig Podcast right here in his premises, Waterman House, in the Cathedral Quarter, right in the heart of it. And I keep forgetting every time I've finished a guest that I'm working because I want to go and like sit down in his lovely restaurant and have a glass of wine and enjoy the amazing experience he creates for his customers. But I have to work today. Um, I am promising myself, me and Jared are definitely going to come back here. But Niall has been in the kitchen since he was literally 14 years old. He worked in London for 12 years and he does say that that's where he trained with the best in the industry and where he learned a lot of his skills in the cooking um, industry anyway. But he's also learned a lot about business and that's very clear with every all the success that he has had. He has opened multiple restaurants in Belfast and has been recognised for food and service excellence. And we'll hear a lot about that on the podcast today by the Michelin Guide, the Waitrose Food Guide. I've got them all written here in front of me. So many food and wine magazine and in the prestigious Georgina Campbell Awards. So many of you probably already know James Street South. Very, um, uh, he likes to call it the old favourite. Um, and it's been open for 20 years. It's just coming up on the 20 year anniversary now very soon in Belfast. And everybody loves James Street South, um, myself included. And since 2019, Niall has embarked on his biggest project to date, which is where we are sitting today and recording Waterman House. And it has a cookery school next door. It has event spaces, tasting rooms alongside his restaurant, which is right on the cobble street there, looking out over the Cathedral Quarter. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, in it, I think a really key thing that we're going to talk about today and which a lot of people um, are probably thinking more about now is like nurturing the people that are in your industry and in your team. And Niall has his own chef apprenticeship scheme in collaboration with Belfast Met. And that's really, really important to him. And we'll find out why in the podcast today. And I think a lot of business owners are going to get a lot from that about how we have to be nurturing the people in our industry to make it the best it can be. Um, he's featured many television programs, so he's not one bit shy, I know, about coming on the podcast. From Great British Menu, um, he also had the opportunity to cook for Prince Charles and Camilla. I'm sure that was um, eventful, um, alongside a weekly recipe column in the Irish News as well. But as I said, he's first and foremost about the people, the people who come into his restaurant, the people that work um, in his businesses, the people of Belfast. And um, he's just going to talk today about how other people have been so important on his road to success and about mentors. I'm going to talk about mentors and that's a big thing when you're in business. You need a mentor. Um, and I'm not going to talk anymore or else he's going to have nothing to talk about. But we're going to get the nitty gritty today. Um, thank you for being on the thank Dig you. Podcast now. Was that all right? Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Did I say anything wrong? Is that all? Right? Timeline and all. You know? Yeah, it's profit. Yeah. It's, I mean, yeah. It's, it's Started off in London. Yeah. Yeah, I started off in Belfast with Paul Rankin in Roscoff. That was uh, really our strand restaurant, really, when I was 14. Um, uh, and then from there, which was the, the restaurant in Belfast, that in 44 were the two restaurants. And then went from there to Ros- uh, Dinadrian and did my, started my apprenticeship there and then went to Roscoff. And everything changed after my Paul Rankin. That was it, really. On the way, made me a foodie. Um, it's just and, and when you say everything, like a lot of um, business people talk about key moments, that was probably a key moment. That was, that was one of the most, uh, over, the, uh, over the years I've worked with some amazing chefs and to me it's just, it's, I mean you can't name them all, but there's certain people who I've worked over the years, which we'll go into later on, who have really had massive, for different reasons, you know, and once again, some of them are brilliant chefs, some are very creative, some are unbelievably organised, some are brilliant businessmen. So to me, it's, uh, it's you look at everybody and I'm a real believer and uh, my dad always said, you can always learn something from somebody, no matter who it is. And to me, it's having, being switched on to see it. And to me, that's what it's all about. And with Joanne and myself. So uh, Joanne's your wife. Joanne's, Joanne's the wife. She, Joanne's she, boss. She runs the company. <laughs> she, she's, the, she's the, like, I mean, we sort of come up with the ideas and then Joanne sort of does all the, the, the business side of it, money side of it. Um, but, I mean, there's no way I'd be here if it wasn't for Joanne. Not a chance. I wouldn't have no interest in it. She, so she sort of pushes me forward and mm-hmm. gets me out of my comfort zone. 
and then sure. off we go. And that, to me, that's important, really important. It is. You need that backup and support. It's hard to do it on your own. But when you were in those early days in London, what was the most valuable lesson? That Obviously, you learned the skill, but what was the most valuable lesson that you kind of learned during this time? Okay. Communication is the key. Um, to me, in the kitchen, work in the kitchen, working with the front of house, communicating with the front of house, so everything ran smooth. The better you communicated, the easier it was. That, that, that's the key. So it's like coming in, doing your notes, doing your mise en place notes, having everything organised, having everything organised for the guy coming in the following day, front and back of house. That's what it was all about because then your life got easier. You know, and that is the key. That is the key. And the key across all business sectors, really, because yeah. that can be transferred to everything. Like even the key to me being here today, I had to communicate with so many people to make it happen, you yeah, included, totally. and have meetings and all of that. So communication, I suppose you learned that from the early days. But then you came back to Belfast and... Um, you and Joanne then took on this, um, you know, uh, I suppose you were on the train of business then and you opened James Street South, isn't that right? Yeah, I sort of came back by, by accident. I came back to open up a, a hotel or open the kitchens in a hotel called uh, Ten Square, which in its day was amazing. Like the, the fit out was incredible. The kitchen was incredible. There was no expense bird, like no expense bird, the wine list. And that's where I met a lot of people within Belfast who then would change my life to come and work for me and all the rest of it. A lot of contacts and all the rest of it. And uh, I was standing there. And it, was, it was a short contract. And I was going to go back to London. And then I walked around Belfast and went, mm, I might, uh, might open a restaurant in Belfast. At this point, we've just bought a flat in London. So uh, Joanne went, what? Seriously? And I said, yep. Um, what do you think? So we, I found a site. And uh, I went into the site. First day, I went into the site with a guy called William King, who worked for me for years. who's was one of my best friends who passed away there a few years ago there. And he said, what do you think? And he says, let's go for it. And so a sort of momentum, Joanne commuted back and forth from London and everything we had we put into the business. That's everything we put, had we had into the business. And a lot of people say, I've said it many times, why do we have linen on the tables? Why what? Why do we have linen on the tables? Okay. Because we couldn't afford decent tabletops. So we just threw linen on. And the idea was that it was a fine dining restaurant. And to me, just because it's got linen on the table doesn't mean it's fine dining. You had many great French brasseries and bistros and they've got linen on tables. But it just clicked. And then for quite a long time, the restaurant was flying. Really doing well, really doing well. And then we had a lot of, like, early days, it was like Garth McKay, who's now at Muddler's Club, Stevie Toman, who's at Ox, you know, um, even Rab, the, the, the KP, Sean, his son worked for us. So over the years, we had, um, the early days of James, we had an amazing team, amazing team, really, really. The crack was 90, you came in, smiling, all the rest, but some days it was tough, mm -hmm. but it was absolutely incredible. And Belfast was buzzing in those days, wasn't it? Belfast was starting to grow. And like I said, a few people, few well-known businessmen say well, we're going to open up James Street and he says you're mad James Street South it was a, like there was a horse at the end of the street you had vehicles beside us it was an absolute dump like really bad and I says like all the good restaurants I know were in the back streets so hey, the rent's cheaper you're still in the fur it's easy to get to and then all of a sudden um, we opened James Street up and it was doing really well and then friends of ours opened the Dollar Gallery Toby and Alan opened the gallery across the Ray Gallery across the road from us I sort of give that wee buzz, mm -hmm. you know, and then the pub across the way got done it. Mark took that on and Mark Brown took that pub on and he'd done it up as well. Mm -hmm. So we're really starting to come a wee, 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 wee the cosm of places in Belfast to go to. And there'd be people listening uh, to the podcast that have bricks and mortar shops and and restaurants and, and businesses in towns. Mm -hmm. And there's that whole talk of the high street is dead and the city life and all that. People are not, you know, perhaps eating out now. And all. But you've talked there about together collectively as businesses totally. you got together to make totally. that area really good but to me you don't necessarily have to be on a main 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 thoroughfare because social media tells yeah. you everything you know everybody's got their phones now and so to me you don't need that expense you know some people are there fair enough to me i just didn't have the money to do it so yeah. that's how the decision was made for me i mean i wasn't going to get too far in debt or actually we're massively in debt but <laughs> not any further more yeah and then that's where it is but it's like anybody anybody opens a business in my view is a champion yeah. yeah, I mean, he's got the nerve to open a business, you know. There's a lot of people have turned around recently said to me, I want to open a business. And I said, you open a business this time, just be careful. You know, get the right time and do it. Because you said there are a lot of people said you were mad. And I do hear that from people in business who have that like spirit and that fire to do something. And maybe perhaps family would say, oh, they're they're cautious, they're worried. They're like, don't. What you said to me when we were talking before you come on here, did you talk to people who weren't in the industry? I, I talked to a lot of people who weren't in the industry and majority weren't in my family. You know, because no matter what, your family as a rule aren't going to lie to you. You know, only if they're brutally honest. And so I spoke to like uh, a lot of different, like even 
like remember like there was a gentleman called Andrew Crichton who's an absolute legend in Belfast and he says you're mad opening a restaurant in James Street it's a terrible sight and uh, as all the opportunity I can do I still poke him about it you know mm-hmm. but um, but once again it's 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 what we could afford and having belief in yourself but once again doing the numbers of course and we're going to talk about that too but just when you've talked about um, that man Andrew and other people who aren't in the industry that's mentorship without really knowing that it is yeah. you were get, seeking out mentors and mm. that that term is through about a lot um, at the minute and uh, people in smaller businesses can be overwhelmed by the fact they need to find a mentor how how do you find a mentor to me it's about a relationship like um it's a relationship and even l- listen to people talking to them um friendship trust that's the key thing and over the years like there's a gentleman called Bram McKnight who um came to the restaurant quite a lot we've done a lot for the family and different events and stuff but and a truly a brilliant businessman and uh, Calvin is his business partner but um, I would definitely bounce things off them over, over the years just wee small things mm-hmm. and then over the years there's a load of other different people but it's and it's, is that about getting out into going into spaces where they are or how do, people, how do people it's, find it's, it the, the great thing about it is they come to our restaurant so people come to the restaurant as a rule they're very relaxed start to have a good time so they're more open to you if I was to go into their office and do it like that, there's no way I would get anywhere. The Dig Podcast needs your help. Did you know that we have thousands of people download the podcast each week, but still people haven't subscribed or followed on the channel? So I'm asking you, if you listen on Apple or Spotify, if you could hit follow. If you listen on YouTube, then hit that subscribe button. It means that I can reach out to even more guests bring even more actionable advice that can help you in your business. What advice would you give to people though that don't have the restaurant, don't there maybe a service based business, maybe they work online, but they're trying to seek a mentor. How do you do that? To me, it's 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 face to face. Uh To me, I mean you can do as much online as you want, but to me, the key thing when it comes down to personality and and looking somebody in the eye. That's the key thing. And going to networking events. Yeah. You know, go go and look in the top hundred businesses. Look at who those people are. See if they're open, having talks at University of Ulster or Queens or whatever, and see if you can get in there and then introduce yourself. Yeah, they might not have time for you, but even though when it see mentorship, they'd be talking to a room of hundred people. Mm-hmm. You're still getting something out of that day. Absolutely. So that's still mentorship, no matter what. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be a one to one. Yes, I have this story that I always tell where, um, whenever I was in my early days in retail, and I would have been going to loads of shops mm-hmm. or events, seeking out mentors without really knowing. I was like, who's going to help me on this journey that I'm on, and. I went and I actually heard someone speak at an event and it was Neve, who's now my colleague for the Northern Ireland Social Media Awards and we mm-hmm. actually connected after that and are now business partners. So, I, and, But I remember my mummy saying to me at the time, why are you going to all these things? Like, you're not making no money when you're away there. You should be in your shop. You don't, you know, it's a waste of time. His daddy said it to me too. But I, I knew I needed somebody. I needed something, somebody to, to show me the way or to guide me or to get advice from. Totally. So that's good good advice from you to, to say to people, get out there, get to events, but, speak but to people. Yeah, but it's also seeing how people run their businesses as well. You know, it's talking to them how they run their business. And it's like, you know, when, when I was in London and working in the Avenue, I worked for a guy called Chris Bogger, who was a big hitter in London at the time. And I mean, he's, he's an absolute gentleman. But even in the management meetings and all the rest, but he had like, uh, Carrie was our... Uh, Carrie Barry, our GM was doing majority of the talking and he was sitting behind just listening. And any time he opened his mouth, it was like a font of knowledge came out. And he was the most placid, down to earth guy going, mm-hmm. you know, like, and, and that's where he was. But the stuff that I meant from just even in the meetings and the questions he was asking was those questions that would make you twitch a wee bit. Mm-hmm. That's the guy. And it's a bit like Joanne, which is a meeting. She'll always ask the question, makes everybody twitch. Mm-hmm. And you need those type of people around you and then you learn from it as well. Absolutely. And you don't, People think you have to pay for a mentor. You don't always. No, 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 God, no. No, no. You know, no, it's about relationships. It is. It's relationships. It's Mentoring is relationships, isn't it? That's, really? that's the key thing. And then you can also then turn around. And there's people I've spoke to where I've asked them direct questions about business and they've shied off answering it. And then I thought, God, they're being a bit weird and all the rest went to the answer because they don't want to put them in a position where you feel, where I feel. And I asked them in later life, why did you never ask that question? I asked you a question, why did not answer it? And he says, now, A, I don't be responsible for anything happening in your business. So that's why I didn't answer that question. So, but you also get out of that there. But the to me, her that you, need, really? you know, you don't always get the answer you need or the answer you want to hear. Yeah. So sometimes if somebody doesn't answer a question. That's your answer? There's your answer. So, and that, that's that's the way I look at it. And, uh, you know, so as I say before, I keep on saying to the guys, keep pushing on, keep changing, you know, and that's it. And change is good. 
change is and competition is good change is scary but change is good and if yeah. you're not changing you're standing still isn't that right because you changed from fine dining then to the bar and grill mm-hmm. and it was at a very pivotal time in Belfast what was happening that weekend be, specifically be, being realistic the, the weekend we were doing is when the, the crash came and then the flag protest and all the rest of it and we were sitting there and it was, it was a very very hard time in Belfast it was a really hard time and we were looking at a lot of things were moving around in Belfast and we turned around and said to ourselves if we don't change this restaurant um, being realistic we're dead in the water and then all of a sudden the building beside us called Vico's um, came up for rent and like opening a restaurant in the middle of a recession you sort of need your head seen to but I turned around myself we don't do this here we don't take this gamble we're, that's what's done so Joanne and myself made the decision um, let's go for it so it was a massive investment MTV Awards was in the future so by the time we got the change of use got that done said to the builders, we need to be open for this point because you're going to have the press, you're going to have the media, you're going to have everybody in Belfast, around the world, all the, all, I mean, celebrities and all the rest of it. So to me, we opened a bar and grill up, the media was brilliant, and then just went, like, went just rocketed. So from being in a recession where the re- James Street overnight, somebody just turned the tap off. On oh, the re- fine dining elevator? Fine dining, it's like just turned, tap just turned off. And people, the people can have the perception that they're in a fine dining restaurant. But then they went into the bar and grill and virtually spent the same money. So it's all about perception as well. And the bar and grill with Carl Johansson and Paul, the front of the house, um, we set it up and Monto was in the kitchen and, and, Ka- and Carl Johansson's the kitchen. The guys were amazing. And we really pulled together. It was really tough going. Um, but it really worked for us. Is there a lesson there in if you don't change and and embrace what's going on around you, you're, you will? You mean, here's, here's a like if you hadn't changed, like nothing stays the same. Your, your restaurant did not stay the same. Didn't say the same, but then the other example of that there is we had James Street going with all white walls, white linen, and all the rest of it. And one day I was sitting in the restaurant and I get bored. I said, Joanne, we're going to have to do a refit here. So we spent it, got sort of like 130000 on a refit. And then I was sitting in the restaurant and it was beautiful, all open plan. James Street looked amazing. Dave was in the kitchen. Um, um, Will was on the floor and all the rest of it doing his bit. But um, to me, then I realised it was lovely. And I went, I don't want to do fine dining anymore. I don't want to do this type of food or perception of this type of food. And uh, we only spent all this money, and I turned around and f- like a few months later, we said, right, we're going to have to change this here. And, uh, so you changed too? I changed as well, even though we spent the money and we said the change was good. He said, this is not working. So then a, f- a few years later, then we decided, right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to merge two restaurants together. So we merged James Street and the Bar and Grill, and just James Street South and Bar and Grill together, and just called it James Street. Yeah, and it works. This, and you've talked about how you don't want to be, I thought this is really good actually, um, you don't want to be the best, you want to be the old favourite. I want to be old, old, old faithful, old and faithful. you are. That's it. So you just turn around and says, you know what you're going to get on, on in, uh, in the restaurant. You come, the quality is going to be, the service is going to be there. So no matter what, we don't want to drop the ball. Then don't get me wrong, don't, we don't always get it right. No, I know. But you know, we, 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 we try to get it as much as possible. Um, and to me, that's what it's all about. Um, but as a rule, we've got a very young team, some full-time, some part-time. But it's just train them up, train yeah. them up into hospitality. And we're going to talk about apprenticeships now, yeah. but, but there's going to be a lot of hospitality people tuning into this. I just know it because why wouldn't you when someone in your um, with your expertise is on the podcast? But experience, you can have the best food in the world. But and I, I like we've all been there where the experience when you go in, it's not good. Talk to us about how important that is. To me, it's like I, I, I was out for a meal last Two Saturday ago, I can't remember what I had. I met one. Di- I remember one dish I had, but I can't remember anything else I had. But what I can remember is th- the girl and fellow who served me, the atmosphere in the place, the music in the place, and I actually may remember the layout of the place. And you mean that's what I so like as I mean, as, as I say, and I've said it. People, a lot of people disagree with me, but to my my opinion, what makes a great restaurant, and they're all very very close to each other. And as a chef saying this here is atmosphere, service, and food. In that order. In that order. And atmosphere, me, service and food. That's it. And they're all very close to each other. But there's no point. Like I've had in three star mixings which have had zero atmosphere and I couldn't wait to get out of there. Um, I were at, at really, really amazing restaurants and the waiter just, just didn't work for me. You know, and I've worked in restaurants where the food was amazing but I just couldn't wait to get it because it didn't have the other two. So if you can bring this two, those three things together to me, that is success. That is, you're doing something really special. It's like the old Paul Rankin Roscoff restaurant. Like that, to me, was a st- was, the, was the beginning of food. Uh, it was Paul Rankin and Patrick Gilbo in Dublin. To me, they are the ones, in my opinion, in Ireland, started it off. You know, that's what started off. And definitely in Northern Ireland, in Belfast, 
Paul Rankin was the catalyst. That was it. That changed everything. The quality, him and Jeannie come into the kitchen, Darren Simpson, myself, Robbie Miller. The, I mean, Shank's restaurant, Robbie's no longer with us, sadly. And Shirley in the front of the house, you know, um, Solvik on the door. You know, we, we it was an amazing team, but like nobody in Belfast had seen us here before. Mm -hmm. And they were coming in and it was fully booked every lunch, every dinner. When the rugby was on, we had seats in the kitchen, TV in the corner, and we had people, customers coming in watching rugby. You know, whatever whatever big sport event, we were all big time in their sport. But that's where, I, that would, to me, was the biggest catalyst, catalyst in Belfast. And I learned from Paul Rankin, what I learned from Paul was incredible about quality of product, all about hospitality, all about service. And, you know, and like I remember going into Roscoff for, for lunch um, with friends, and next thing, I'm sitting there nodding away, next thing I turn around, there's a plate there, look down, and the plate's away. You don't even notice the waiter taking the plate away. Mm -hmm. But the key thing was the atmosphere. It was absolutely mm -hmm. buzzing. And it was full all the time. And that's what I loved about the place. The place was incredible. I know. And whenever you're saying all of that, I think across all industries, atmosphere, service and product could relate to them all. Like Absolutely. when you go into a shop, a clothing shop, when you go into a solicitor's office, it's about the atmosphere, the service of the person at the front. Before you even get in totally. there, you've made your mind up whether yeah. you like the place. Totally. And so, that's it. So, so anybody that's listening that hasn't looked at that, you might have a deadly product and deadly service, but if you're not coming up Trump's like what Niall's saying with all those other things, I think you need to look at that. That's all part of business. And you're holistic like that. You look at all parts. But to me, the, the, yeah, look, you look at everything within your, like, like we sit down and there's like, as I turn around and say, there's something not right. Say, like friends of mine have texted me, you've got a bull, but in your restaurant, you've got this. Oh, right. Okay. And I turn around and just keep Thanks telling Thanks for telling me. me. Keep telling me. Keep telling me. The other now, I mean, if something's too salty or something, this is wrong or that's not right. You mean, everybody takes criticism about thing. I take it only one way and it's a positive. Now, don't get me wrong, there's some people turn around and they're like, seriously. So that's what I want to say to you. There's a um, a guy who's actually going to be coming up in the podcast mm. very soon. Um, I'll not say his name in case he pulls out on me, but um, he's promised me he will. But he said a thing, and you probably know from the media because they've reported on this, um, the customer's not always right. Talk to me about that. I know it's a touchy one because there's customers listening, but you just said there, the criticism comes I and mean, you take it. But sometimes... The customer's not always right. To me, it's it's a different. I put it a different way. Okay. Not that the customer's not always right. The customer's got a perception of what they want. That's so true. And that's the thing. And then some people want. You mean if somebody as somebody wants a bowl of soup, a well done steak, and a frothy coffee, that's my dad. You know, <laughs> I know. My daddy it. too. And that's it. And he's a plain simple person. And when it comes to food, but that's what he likes. And to me, so you're not the type of man to say, no, "Oh, that's not the best way to eat steak." No, oh, I do that. <laughs> <laughs> I said all all the time to him, but he doesn't listen. To all right, okay. But to me, it's it's to me, it's it's that whole thing where you, you turn around and it's it's where the customer turns around and their expectation of what they want. Now, once again, you know, like we we serve water with our espresso, and people think it was a glass of crap. And it's why you serve in water isn't because you just had your meal, you're clearing your palate, so it doesn't go bitter, and then you drink your coffee. And, well, I didn't know and then as soon as you have your espresso, so if you go to a espresso bar in Italy, they've always got a wee water fountain. So you hit the water fountain, and then you drink your espresso. And that's in your stomach, you're done. Yeah. So as soon as I drink an espresso, that's me done for the night. That's me done, ready to go home. No more nibbling. No more nibbling. Job <laughs> done. And to me, sometimes people just don't get it. Yeah. Each time we would try to do something a wee bit different and all the rest of it. But to me, you have to, like, we used to serve, like, cucumber in our water years ago in Hatskies when it first opened. And customers hated it. So I turned around and I went, oh, right, fair enough. So we just stopped it. Yeah, okay. So it's listening to your customer, yeah, giving them what they want. Yeah. And, and they, they're they saying it's not right. It's okay, no problem. Well, that's, that's not, a, not a big biggie. Take a bit of cucumber out of water is not a biggie. Again, that's change and you're not adverse to change because you need to change to mm -hmm. move. Yeah. Um, you had a vision for a restaurant then in the cathedral quarter yep. and we're sitting in the lovely cathedral quarter now but you did something that I could just never imagine doing whenever we were talking. You mm -hmm. told me you did this. That you went and asked an existing premises to sell to me. I was going to close up. To close up. <laughs> yeah, no, I know, it was a bit cheeky. No? That's so cheeky. I don't know. But, but, so how do you do, how do you get the nerve to do that? No, because you you look at their business and you think to yourself, it was a great site. And Michelle was a, she, like you mean Michelle had a great business for years, but you mean she had a lot on her plate. So she was doing Irish news, she was like she was doing a lot of food in a lot of different places. And uh you mean and she she's in the game for her and her husband been in the game for a long, long time, a total such a lovely lady. And I very politely went in and said to her, and it was just by luck and by chance. Like she could have turned around and says, Go away, not a problem. But it was just purely luck. And that's how it was. And then we, we spoke to her and then we came to agreement. And then we, we sort of like took over, took over, you mean, it was called Printers. And then we took it over and changed it to Hatskies. And that, that's how it came about. And then we got a guy in to find out about the name and the area. And it was after a guy called Stuart Hasky. 
And it's great when you see these guys walking around, the tour groups walking around, and they're saying, and Stuart Hatsky, they made swords. They made pots and pans. You know, that's what they made inside. They make all these stories. They ran in the tears. I know, they got dug in there. They <laughs> made pots and pans, and I think it's like pots and pans restaurant. So, you know. so, so yeah, that, there's, a, there's a whole other podcast there about, you know, stories and history and making yeah. sure that's all reflected in your business. But so, Hadsky's um, was born, and, but again, you, we talked about them when it closed. You weren't afraid of change either, as in no. you decided to um, tell us about that transition. Hadsky's been going for 10 years, and then we, we turned around and, uh, the the COVID came and I was just also like another mentor of mine in the area would be Joanne and Willie Jack like I would bounce a lot like Willie Jack would own the Duke of York and it's like Mark Byrne as well another friend of mine I would bounce stuff off him as well um, and uh, you mean and John Eastwood as well so there's a load of people in my life who have bounced things off but when I came to the Cathedral Quarter um, I sort of really struck a gr- I mean a great relationship up with Willie Jack and Joanne mm-hmm. who's his wife and it's very similar to the way me and Joanne work as well the uh, story of two Joannes, as the goes, but mm-hmm. you know, and that's how we came back with uh, with Hatskies, and then Willie Jack bought this street here, um, the building, and then Joanne said, "Now, do you want to take on Waterman House from Willie?" Doesn't at that point Willie didn't need it, and he still regrets selling to me, but that's <laughs> where it goes. But um, so that's how Waterman came about. So, and that's going back to, and, and I was in the traders group before. in Dungannon yeah. about the traders all yeah. Yeah. talking and yeah. coming totally. together to create something good. Yeah, coming, it's it's about the whole area and what he, what he was very much, it's all about the Cathedral Court, it's all about Belfast. And he sort of got inside my head and went, he's totally right. That is totally right. The way he thought, the way uh, he invested in his business, invested in the area, invested in the staff. Is incredible. Like the guy is just like as I said, I'd hate to be inside his head because mm-hmm. it's a hundred miles an hour. Oh, he's some man, and he is. And but that's that. I learned so much from him, and then Hatskis, and then we took this on. And I said, "There's no point having the two after COVID having the two restaurants competing, and plus there's no staff in the industry. So at this point here, a load of people have left just after COVID. A load of people have left the restaurants. So we said, right, we're going to have to cut our cloth here, close Hatskis down, and then we are going to open up Waterman. And you say that so easily there but was there anything in your mind no. where you're thinking oh, is this this is doesn't isn't good for me to do this this doesn't look good for me to do this this is, means it didn't work or like I'm just thinking of all the things that people go through when they have to change like that. no no to me to me it's 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 time a business needs to change if you stand still and think oh god you're 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 emotional your business and all the rest but nobody says you're not sad doing this but you're not slightest it's had its time so like when we closed Hatskis down it was sitting there friends of ours had neighborhood their business burnt down um, crossing St. Anne's Cathedral and we said to him Oshin, do you want to take this on here sitting there doing nothing so he's now got neighbourhood in there for a while and then we'll go from there but to me it's 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 the bigger picture and the bigger picture is Waterman House are we going to then go back to Hatskies or the site yes we are so to me you mean that's where we're coming from in the, in the future but it's never a failure it's always learning oh no it's never, it's a, never, if that never you know, just because you've closed something down doesn't mean a failure but it's closing down for a reason so, we have me strategic of what you're going to be doing and how you're going to get there but if you close down it's you know and think I couldn't make money or anything else then if you want to call the failure you can I just think a learning curve there's no point in being negative over it it's hard enough closing a business down it is but if you've got a reason for doing it and you know there's a longer game go for it I know and be open like you're so open about that I think people need to have that conversation because so many people like you're not supposed to who says you're supposed to be in the same place and do the same job and and for the rest of your life you're allowed to change like, uh, to be only one life change is good change is good and there's like so many restaurateurs who have got especially in London have got one site next thing on that site and then they move to another site but just change bring the name over it happens all the time and it happens all the time solicitors firms move move premises all the rest of it it happens all the time I know. and some some get bigger some get smaller somebody may be about to retire as Nick Price the, the, the legend of Nick's Warehouse you know, yeah. I mean that's I remember the first time I was in Nick's Warehouse the first time I met Muscles and the town called Malice by the jam was playing uh-huh. and to this day I still remember having the meal and the jam was playing and um, I think I was Scott I must have been 15, 16 at the time and Nick was the, he's the one started him and Willie Jack were the ones who started the Cleo Quarter Up Oh really? Oh I didn't know that um, Yeah I you didn't know. know that about about that, that he's here from the Willie's here from the very start so, <laughs> Willie's been here God the I don't know how many, 40 years. Right, anybody, does, anybody that has had a drink in the Duke of York probably knows Willie very well, yeah. but he's he's a character for sure and a mentor to people in this area okay. and to you. Um, so you aren't afraid to change and you're not afraid to move and when something isn't working, but you did talk about being a busy fool to me. 
And yeah. this is a big thing now. This is, I, yeah. You know, people talk to me about this all the time. I just feel like, I just feel like I'm so busy, but I'm not getting anywhere. What 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 would you say about that? To me, um, you mean, it's one thing me and Joanne learned from COVID. Like at one point we had like, I think it was 100 and 128 staff at one point between everything we had going on. And then you look at your bottom line and uh, yeah, we're paying a lot of taxes, paying everything else, paying a lot of wages. And then we sort of like brought the business back a bit and for different reasons, like that wasn't working or that was working or we're going to move that to here. And and then COVID kicked in. And then at that point there, were like, there was very few positives out of COVID. And the only positive, and they had to get something out of it, was A, the time we had with our family, which you never get back. Um, but personally, it was time I had with the family. But the one thing is then looking at our business. Like uh, we were doing the box scheme, which we we're going to bring back again. And um, which was absolutely brilliant for us. Like you really seen your clientele coming in, the ones who supported you, but also wanted something different, something good. Didn't want to keep on cooking their own food. But it was, I was actually uh, shocked and um, slightly emotional sometimes because like these people came out, lifted and they've supported me over, you I mean, at that point, 18 years of business and they're coming in. And you're, it was just blowing me away, the amount of regulars coming in, even people who have who have retired, because you've got sort of that cycle where you've got people coming in for like six, eight years, and then all of a sudden they're retiring and you don't see them for a bit. And they were coming in with their kids. And like you feel older when you see their kids growing up. Mm-hmm. Like they come into your restaurant away, and then all of a sudden they're hiring our private dining room out. You know, so to me, that's where the box scheme really kicked off for us and was really good. And it kept us going, the business going. But the key thing is it made us crunch down numbers. What do we need? What are we wasting time on? What are we wasting money on? And So that's sitting down and actually physically looking look, at the numbers on the Looking at crunch. And that was Joanne. Joanne crunched the numbers down and she was like, like brutally honest. You know I mean, and that's what you need to be. That's not working. And, you know, it's, it's not working for us. We change that there. We change this here. We're, we're, this is how we're going to move our business forward. I talk about that because you now op- you use of a strategy now where you're not open at the start of the week and that was all due to looking and seeing we, what was working. We were seven days a week and we were seven days a week. We didn't make any, like Tuesdays are a dead day for us. We never made money on Tuesday. And then we, we started up where, you know, like for example, Michael Dean's closed on a Sunday, Monday. We opened on a Sunday, Monday. Michael Dean's closed, on, opened on a Tuesday, Wednesday. There's no point in the two of us beside each other battling against each other to try to get the business when the business isn't there because there's nobody in the offices. And lunchtime and stuff like that there. So we decided to open five days a week. So like James Street's open on, on a Monday night, closed Tuesday, Wednesday. It's open a Thursday night, closed a Thursday lunch, and then open all day Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And we've cut our staff levels back and we've made the business tighter. And that's our model going forward until we feel comfortable that we can open more. Like certainly I want to open Wednesday, Wednesday night. I would certainly love to open lunches. But until you get people back in the offices and people back into Belfast, it is not feasible. And it's like, like a friend of mine, Toby, where he's constantly saying, open, open more lunches. I say, Toby, I need to be doing 40 people every lunch just to break even. Mm-hmm. So there's no so point. you know your numbers? You have to know your numbers. So there's no point in doing it. Every time you bring your, your rent, your rates, your kitchen costs, your floor costs, your, you mean, crunch it down. And then after that there, then you know where you stand. And plus the way people drink as well is very, very different as well. You know. Don't be a busy fool. It's definitely. Definitely don't. That is the key. That's hard because you feel like if you grind, 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 no. it's going to come. But the thing it's going to work. But how was that? When I first opened up James Street, I was doing I was doing seven nights. I took a Sunday lunch off. Sunday lunch off because we were closed. But I had seven nights for two and a half years, three years. Mm-hmm. So I took Christmas Day, Boxing Day off. Like I worked and worked and worked. I really enjoyed what I did. But we had no kids at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, Joanne was commuting back from London because we, we needed the money. Um, but it's you mean just don't do a bit as a fool. Your time is precious. Your time is so important, especially with the kids, especially with the family. And that's like same as the staff as well. It's like, you know, if you can't run your business where your staff can take, like, say, Black Friday off when the kids are having their school plays, mm-hmm. then what's the point? Yeah. What is the point in doing this here? Because to me, it's not just about me and Joanne. It's about Belinda, Laura, you know, Aaron, Cahill, Ryan over in James Street, Paul and James. It's about the team. And it's, it's a good for them because if they're happy, they're happy at home. They'll be happy at work. And we, we try our best for everybody. 
Well, Laura, that does the events in here that helped me yeah, yeah. get into Waterman Heights, she said to me this morning, whenever we were coming in, you, you might be glad to hear this, but I was like, do you like your new job, Laura? Because she's just came from somewhere else. And she's like, oh my God, I love it. They're so good to me. And I said, what do, what do you mean? Like, and she's like, well, like it was my birthday last week and I was going away. And they were like, why are you still here, Laura? You know, you should be away and you can go early today or, you know, you should be away on. We can get that covered for you. So, you know, and she, and she said all these other things that you do for her as well. And I was like, oh my God, so good to hear that someone of, you know, of your success and your whatever, it treats your people like that. That's more Joanne than me, be honest. Oh, no, stop to mention <laughs> you. To mention <laughs> you, but, but you, the people. So I want to talk about the apprenticeship because that's a, that's because you want to help your people. So talk about your apprenticeship. Um, uh, the apprenticeship came, um, to me, the, the way I was like from, from, from early days in Denadry and a guy called CJ, who was like the larder chef there and Pat Kells and Clifford Caspi great teachers they just wanted to teach and I always thought they were like God they're teaching me because they want to teach me and it says now the quicker you learn the easier I, uh, my job is mm -hmm. so the better I teach you the better you're going to be the less I have to do mm -hmm. and I was like very young and I was going God I, you know it's like I'm, you've just burst my bubble there but um, but they were amazing teachers and uh, like from like just the basics of, but like I mean then chefs wouldn't do it now but like breaking a venison down plucking pheasant cutting pheasant you know, it was all the, the things you would not do now because restaurants just don't have the staff. Hotels don't have the staff, but there they had, they were doing everything. Michael Young was doing the butter carving and, uh, you know, uh, world champion beekeeper. It was just an amazing hotel at the time in the early days. Um, and it's like everything has sort of drifted to the side a bit um, after certain people left. But then you go to Roscoff and it's the, the whole process of training and mentoring. And I learned that from Paul Rankin as well. And throughout the years, I've learned so many people who are really good trainers. But over them all, probably the best two trainers, people who trained me, were definitely Gary Rhodes and another guy called Wayne Tapasfield. And also Dean Carr as well. And they're the three guys. Well, Gary Rhodes was like a TV personality. But at the same time, the difference between the middle of the summer and Christmas in the restaurant was about four or five people. We were fully booked all the time, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. And for a restaurant in London to say that, they're in the middle of May for... And it was a cheap restaurant. And um, people came in for a couple of dishes. The bread and butter pudding. The, uh, it was a smoked haddock, Welsh rabbit. The oxtails. And, they, and the lemon tart. And it was those four dishes. And a few other dishes on top of it. Like, you know, but sold. People came for You mean, and sold out all the time. And they were really you know, selling dishes. But his organisation, Gary Wood's organisation, he knew what he was doing this time next year. That's how organised that guy was mm -hmm. and how structured he was in the kitchen business. He didn't own the business. He did never want to own a business, but he got paid really well for running the business. Mm -hmm. And then it gave him time to do TV and other bits and pieces. Yes. And what I learned from him was structure, discipline, mm -hmm. organisation, and at the same time hardness. Because he was the nicest guy in the world, but when he said something, that was it. Mm -hmm. Done. No messing. No messing. So you've now brought that all that learning and all that, <clears throat> what you've seen him do into your apprenticeships now, so you yeah. can do that for other people, totally. right? So the apprenticeship, because there'll be people listening that perhaps yeah. have young people in their family mm -hmm. that might totally. want to hear about this. Tell us about that there. The apprenticeship, like Aaron's now with me, God, 10 years, and he was my first, he's now my head chef here in Waterman of the restaurant, and Aaron is boy from Campbell, very smart guy. Um, like as I said, I'm probably the stupidest person in the kitchen. Because all the rest of them have got their degrees. All the rest that doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean anything. But, <laughs> but these, like, Aaron came on board and he works so hard. Um, great personality. Um, a great kid. Really, what he did. And he started, so the apprenticeship that you have running that he actually was yeah. part of and is now, like, head chef here, isn't head he? Head chef. He worked the way through, through Belfast. So man. if you're between 16 and 24. Yeah, 24, yeah. We're 20, 24, yeah. And perhaps have left school and don't have the qualifications that you goodness. think you might need. Yep. You're doing this in collaboration yep. with Belfast Met. Yep, they'll put you through your MVQ level one, level two for your basic skills and all the rest of it. And it's a year course. Now, once again, we the first year we took on, I think it was 10 or 12 apprentices. And it was way too much. It was just so much hard work. And then over the years, we've sort of brought it down to, it's down to individuals between four and six, the perfect number. This year we took on... Um, three of them one we got him another job because I knew within us he would have been stunted mm -hmm. and he was more of a hotel chef and mm -hmm. um, then we had went to uh, where did we go to we went to Muddler's Club for our, our dinner so they picked where they want to go to and they picked a Muddler's Club and then all the apprentices come together within three weeks of him left, leaving us 
he was talking about food, talking about restaurants, talking about this. Totally different kid. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was good. I said to him, if this is good for you to go, the door's always open for you. Mm -hmm. The door's always open for the apprentice. They want to chat or they're looking a job in later life. But to me, at the same time, it's good for people to go away. And so many of our apprentices don't work for us, but they stay within the industry. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily you want everybody to... As a business, you can't always afford to take them all on. But at the same time, you want to push them on to other things. And that's it. Even if they're going to go and work for Ewing Smoked Salmon, doing the fisheries, if you're, if you're a fishmonger, if you're going to hotels, you're going to you know, in commercial catering, if you're going to food development, Moy Park or Finnebrogue or whatever it may be, to me, you're staying within the industry. And to me, that's what the apprenticeship is about, is about keeping people within the industry. And then with our front of house with Curtis, who's a, one of our barmen now, he's been with me for, God, like, six years. Um, it's it's pushing them to, about hospitality. Mm -hmm. So the front of house and the back house. We're learning them across, like a holistic approach to totally. the whole thing. Where yeah. would you, like, that's hard to get, like it is now. Like, the, so the thing is, apprentices breed loyalty. So if you spend the time in there, they'll have loyalty to you. Everybody says, people leave, people leave. Of course, people leave your business. That's fine. You don't want them to leave, especially if they're a really good member of staff. But people have to develop another, you have to accept it. There's a certain way of leaving, definitely, give you notice and all the rest, but you don't work out. It's all about respect. Mm -hmm. But within within and within the business, our business, especially for the hunter, front of the house apprentices, um, to me, the most important thing is you're coming into the hospitality game. It's all about hospitality. You're there to look after people when they come in. People come in, they've had maybe something happen in the family or something's happened in work. They're coming in to relax. Our job is to make them relax. Mm -hmm. It's like, I mean, and it's like, I mean, David Gilmore, who was the head chef of James Street, there was a customer who came into the restaurant um, asked, has anybody got a paper? His client hadn't arrived yet. His guest hadn't arrived. Nobody had a paper. Dave went out, there's three quid, go and get a paper for the shipment. Ran out, one of the chefs ran out, got a paper and brought it back to him. To me, even as a head chef, it's all about hospitality. So the true. key thing is hospitality. And and you need apprenticeships to teach people that because people may be good chef, but they might not be good at what you've just no, said. Communicator, communicator um, is the key and being a nice person. That's yeah. it. Because as, as I say to all the guys in the kitchen and on the floor, the kitchen's job is to make the front of the house look good. Mm -hmm. So if something happens, get it in there, let's get it sorted. Mm -hmm. So it's like the chef has cooked something wrong. That's him. We ever, we, chefs never do other. You never cook anything wrong. I mean, but really, the waiter could have put something through wrong with a medium well and social medium rare, whatever it may be. Um, our job is to get it changed, get it back out again, making sure the customer's fine. Yes. You know, and happy. And that's it. If a cake's where you have to send them out a drink or you apologise, of course, but whatever you have to do, you try your best to turn it around. It doesn't always happen, but you try your best. Have you taken time off work, perhaps to care for a relative? Maybe you're juggling it all, just like me, but you're feeling like you may be ready to embrace the world of work again but you just don't know where to start. Timely Careers can help you. It was set up in January. It's a skills training platform and a jobs platform that can help you ease yourself back into work in a flexible way that suits you. It provides training, peer support, mentoring, and so much more. It also connects you with employers, employers that care that you get back to the work the way that, in a way that suits you. So Timely Careers is a fantastic platform. It's there for you and the employer. Don't think that you can't do this. You can with their help. So check out timelycareers.com and let them support you on your journey back to work. If anyone's listening and they're thinking, God, I have a young person in my life that might be used, um, might be suited to that apprenticeship, yep. we're going to put the link on yep. how to um, apply for that apprenticeship yep. or get in touch with anyone in the show notes for the podcast. So you never know who's listening now where you're going to give them that opportunity. You know what I mean? There's 32 hours and that's including your college. Okay. So you're in the kitchen, three shifts. Amazing. And to me, it's really, it's like a buddy system. And you're, you're I mean, and the key thing is, and are the, are the apprentices looked after? Yeah, they are ring fenced. They are wrapped in cotton wool. To me, that's important. Yeah. You know, they, they have to be, but as soon as they come out, they know what they're going to get when they get the job. It's going to be straight in there, but they have already got a year's experience. They already understand how the restaurant works mm -hmm. and they're earning money. It's it's a win-win. It's a no-brainer. It it's a no-brainer. No unbelievable. And fair play to you for doing that with Belfast Matt. I think that's life-changing for people and, totally. and brilliant. Um, and I'm sure there will be people listening that will be finding out more about it. Um, what does the, this is the theme of the podcast for Series 7 is about the future now, about the future of work, the future of business. What does the future of hospitality look like? Because there's a lot of chatter out there about how, you know, obviously the cost of everything's rising. Are people eating at home now? Do you think there's always going to be that? Like, what does the future look like to you think? To me, um, to me at the moment now, you know, uh, the key thing about hospitality is at the moment you've got a lot of stuff 
A lot of restaurants, it's like, how cheap can you put it out? To me, that's not a good thing. To me, I'd rather people come to, like, like a, a regular client to me tell James Street or Waterman, to me, it would be twice a month. That's a regular client tells us. You know, um, the days of people going out for lunch every Friday and Saturday have gone. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, no business lunches or whatever. That, that's really gone because people aren't in the office. Plus, people are like, are drinking less. I mean, to more health uh, conscious, more health conscious, all the rest of it. So you have to release that there or bring that into your menu as well. Especially, you know, uh, it's it's like getting like the guy Rhodes. A lot of his food, and when he was in the city, was very based on women, lighter, healthier, all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. If you fill your restaurant with women, what comes after the men? So, <laughs> you, or about it, so you've got a food restaurant. Is that, a, is that an actual concept? Like, yeah. a, uh, but he did it, his, 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 okay. was, all the restaurants in the city of London were all big, heavy sauces and rich food. Yeah. But in City Road, it was very, very light food. Can I tell you a really funny story and then you're going to keep going? Yesterday, you served Mary and I salad and lovely bread when we were here yeah. uh, prepping. And I came in and Mary said to me, the hummus is on rail with the bread. And I was like, Mary, that's butter that's like a, a lovely chili butter or something and it was just we're i'm just laughing about you changing it for women but we thought the hummus the butter was hummus and that we was, were layering it on that yeah. was that was a whipped butter that's a whipped butter that's a whipped butter with, with tomato no chili in it. all right okay okay well whatever our clip it was it was gorgeous but me and mary were lashing it on but yeah so you yeah it's about um oh yeah the future so you're changing your model to what's happening at the minute to embrace what's happening in the future really the future i mean where the future is god knows where it's going to be but to me the the, the biggest problem now at the moment is a staff to cost yeah, you're, you're, you mean it's crazy, like twenty percent fat, all the rest, but uh, yeah, it's just your costs are incredible, and it's just unbelievable. Staff. So I was at the Belfast Airport, International Airport, mm-hmm. and the robot gave me my. Um, Don't food. you talk to me about it? Go away. <laughs> Not even it did. It just shimmied on up beside me, and there it was. And I thought, right, I wonder. Is this a thing? Like, do you ever see? I, I don't think we'll ever see that in your. Getting back to what I said about restaurants, atmosphere, service, and food. That's it. People don't come to restaurants. If you just come to a restaurant to get fed, that's like McDonald's. That's like a, whatever it is, like a fast food. You come to a restaurant to sit with people, friends, family, to talk, discuss, have fun, bit of crack. That to me is what restaurants are about. If it's a client or whatever else, it's about communication. That's it. That's what restaurants are about. And then the food is part of it and the atmosphere. And when you leave the restaurant, you know, you hopefully you've got a smile on your face. You have a bit of crack and you're just, you know, next time it's meals on you or whatever it may be. That to me is restaurants. It's all about hospitality. That's it. No robots in James Street South or Waterman. No. I would like people to be as consistent as a robot sometimes, <laughs> but have their own personality. So true. And, you know, you can get carried away. And I think a lot of people are getting consumed by, oh, scared about what's coming in the future. But if we bring it back to people, it's all about people, like you said, now, making people feel good, respecting people, um, helping people, mentoring yeah. them. Like I've talked to a lot of people where they've said that other people are closed books within the industry and you did say you feel like people should talk more within their massively, own industry. Massively. Like, like don't get me wrong here, like we, we over the years we, we, we definitely haven't got it all right. Sometimes I'm t- taking up wrong and all the rest of it and you know but within the industry itself uh, the paranoia has to go. You mean people have to be, it's like this is, this is where I am people are coughing me or people are doing this or people, to me it's about the greater good. So as I said it's not about like if you do the best burger or the best club sandwich as a hotel or you do the best fine dining or the best bit of meat or bit of miss fish, whatever you're doing, as long as you do the best quality local produce, to me you're a winner. But then it's communicating that out, sharing your suppliers, all the rest of it. Because a lot of people won't tell people who they supply and all of a sudden that supplier is very small. He's not going to last long. So he has to develop his business on, make his business bigger and by communicating with other restaurants, other restaurants start using them. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden he's getting more money put in as long as the restaurants pay him on time, exactly, which is really important, mm-hmm. paying your suppliers, um, and then all of a sudden he gets momentum, he gets bigger, and that to me is what it's all about. And that's that's where communication comes in, both through supplier, better quality product, into the restaurant, all the rest. So the majority of our fish, majority of our majority of our fish and shellfish is going straight to Europe. So we have to really battle now to get decent quality fish, mm-hmm. and not even the fish we we'll want, because everything is leaving here to go across to Europe and all the rest, but purely because. You mean, A, they're willing to pay more money than we are. And we are really, that's the hardest thing for me now. Mm-hmm. Meat and product is is fine. We're, we're okay there. But to me, the biggest problem is getting our shellfish and our fish at a good quality. Mm-hmm. And it's about other people in the industry talking about what they're doing and the, you could get it here or you could speak yeah. to the, you know. So it's about being open. So 
yes, I've loved talking to you. So I'm down here just to give everybody a bit of context. I'm in Waterman House. To me, a little bit like a fish. <laughs> Excuse the thing. We're just talking about fish. A bit of fish out of water. And because I'm in the city and, and uh, I sometimes feel like, God, should I be in Waterman House? But for the last two days, you and your team have made me and my team feel like we actually belong here. Yes, you do. I know, but but sometimes and there's a lot of people in business that listen feel like other people are perhaps better than them because they're the success or whatever but you've made us feel like we're people and real people doing to me, great things so thank you for that it's like people bringing their kids should kids come in the rest with me yeah they should up to a certain time <laughs> and then after they that after the event. but to me it's it's to me it's it's i mean it's just yeah, we're all on the we're on the same boat. I know. Yeah, well, thank you smart. for that, and thank you for sharing your knowledge for people in the hospitality industry, but also across the business industries. Everybody's going to be able to take something from that. Um, atmosphere, service, and food is what's ringing out in my mind. And finding a mentor; those are the key things that I remember from our company. And looking after your team, looking after your suppliers, looking after your team, and Laura definitely vouched for that. Thank you for being on the podcast, Niall. Um, every all the links will be in the show notes for the apprenticeship, and um, for if you, anyone wants to book and come and enjoy the hospitality at Waterman House all the links will be there and I will be speaking to you next year hopefully on the podcast and there'll be no robots in your restaurants right? not at all